Klaus Svon, welcome to Nature of Reality Radio. It's been almost a month since I've done a show. A lot has been going on in my life, but um, it's great to be back on the air. Hopefully do shows a little more regularly now. <clears throat> it's great to have you as a guest. I'm sorry if I seem a little out of it. I just <laughs> got out of bed, but I did take my caffeine pill to uh, get this, um, make this show the best it can be. Wake me up a little bit. I'll, I should be all right. <laughs> and uh I'm sure you're all excited to be um, on the program and all. Uh, you sure seemed like it. So without further ado, why don't you um, introduce yourself, um, tell the whole world who you are from a primary source perspective, what you experienced that caused you to do the stuff that you do, your how you got into your um, organizations, UFO Sweden and something called um, AFU, I believe it, um, whatever that stands for, you can get into that as well. And then after you uh, enlighten us on who you are and what you experienced, we'll get into the educational aspects of your uh, of your work, what UFOs are and what they aren't, I guess, among other things <laughs> from your experience anyway. So please uh, tell us your life story. You got on the floor. Yeah, Andrew, I've been around for a while. Uh, I'm turning 65 in April and I started in my interest in UFOs and uh, everything connected to the unknown, I should say, really. The paranormal field and folklore, uh, astronomical mysteries, you know, all of that stuff. When I was maybe nine, ten years of age. And at Christmas, I always uh, wanted hard, hard packages. You know, I wanted parcels with something to read inside. And I got books on astronomy, mostly. And after a while, also books on uh, flying saucers, as we called them at that time. Um, and I started to read newspapers. I, I cut uh, articles and, and pasted them into scrapbooks. And all this uh, really, really got to me. So I, when I went 16, I started my own UFO society in my hometown of Mariestad, which is in the south central of Sweden. Uh, at that time, I didn't have a driver's license, um, so my father uh, he drew us around, me and my, my friends, in this small UFO society. Maybe we were 10 guys, not a single girl. And uh, we knocked doors and interviewed witnesses and uh, took pictures, did tape recordings. We did all that stuff that, that I still do today. But now I have my own driver's license, so it's much easier. <laughs> So from 1974 up until now, I have spent quite a few hours every day into UFOs, into researching UFOs. And uh, at this time, I, I spend four hours every day doing this. I also a journalist employed by Sweden's largest morning newspaper, Dagens Nyheter. So I spend my time there, of course. But I'm also very much in demand when it comes to interviews. This day I've been on Swedish radio two times in, in interviews. Uh, I'm also writing books. I think I have, I've written about 27 or 28 books, something like that. I do a lot of lectures uh, and I uh, have field investigator trainee courses within UFO Sweden, where I train our new field investigators once every year and we have done that since 1977. <clears throat> so I think it's the longest running uh, in person course for field investigators in the world. I also do a lot of other things, but uh, that's uh, mainly what I do and also work as you said with AFU, which stands for Archives for the Unexplained. And it is, as you said, uh, the largest archives when it comes to the unknown and UFOs in the world. Uh, we started in 1973, so it started a year before I got hooked into this subject. So that's a, a short introduction who, about who I am. Thank you for that um, intro and uh, boy, I feel like such an ignoramus having never heard of you until seeing you on um, your Alan Steinfeld uh, interview, um, seeing that you have uh, the largest uh, collection of UFO archives in the world, 
thinking, how in the world could I have never heard of you? Well, I mean, you are from Sweden. Um, but then again, I try to go global with my with my research. And uh, it's interesting, I haven't heard about you. I'm sure that every um, country has your equivalent, um, uh, in, in a sense. Um, every country's got its own UFO researchers. But uh, um, you seem to be the cream of the crop among them. And um, in Sweden, of all places, um, is uh, Sweden like a hot spot of UFO activity compared to to other spots uh, in the world? Anything uh, you can say about that, based on um, like other, relative to other countries? Are they do they see a lot of them up there in the um, in that country? No, I shouldn't say that we are we are not sticking out in any respect. Really, we have around three hundred reports every year to our report center, nearly one every day. Most of them are, of course, mundane objects. People are misinterpreting things in the sky. But we are very good at doing investigations. And as I mentioned, we have trained our field investigators for so many years. And we have also been very, very much in uh, mass media in Sweden. Uh, and uh, we have treated uh, very fairly uh, never any 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 programs that we are depicted as uh, loonies or things like that, but we are taken very seriously. And uh, today, when I went to the Swedish broadcaster and uh, gave an interview, uh, I was treated as a part of the science community more than than a UFO buff. And I think we have done this this uh, legwork really for years and years and years. So we are taken seriously by in every every aspect of the Swedish society nowadays. And that makes things much easier. It's much easier to to get people to tell their stories, it's much easier to get in contact with the scientists and much easier to to uh, to reach to the broad community. And we do that all the time. We have a web page called ufo.se and another one called afu.se. So UFO Sweden has one and the archives as well. And the archives, that web page is in English. So I could recommend your, re your viewers and listeners to, to take a look at AFU.se. Okay, I do have your blog up on my um, computer right now. That was the um, link. Uh, you do have a Wikipedia page, and that was the um, link that uh, Wikipedia provided. I did not know about the AFU one. Um, I guess when I upload this to YouTube, I'll try to uh, put both <coughs> in the uh, video description. But uh, I said, um, I don't know what I don't know, and uh, nobody else uh, knows what they don't know. I <laughs> feel like such an ignoramus having never heard about you, even though you have the largest uh, UFO um, archive in the world, according to what the title on that um, on Alan Steinfeld's interview video with you um, said. Now, when it comes to UFOs, there's a lot of people who feel that that's an area of research and their awakening that they can move on from because, um, well, it's... Uh, it's one of those things like I don't think it's in my best interest to speculate. I, I'm not me, but some people say I don't speculate about various UFOs. I see a UFO and I'm like, ah, another UFO. They, we've been seeing them for years. Nothing special, nothing new. Uh, but then again, you don't know what you don't know in regards to what things are. Um, so for those that say UFOs, it's so cliche. Um, We've uh, been researching them for years. It's uh, There's so many other areas of research that you can uh, cover. Just move on from that. Go to something else. Would you say, no, 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 no. There's so much more that we don't know. It's definitely something you cannot never stop researching because the next UFO could be something that could be a type of UFO that's never visited Earth before for all intents and purposes. Uh, you don't know uh, what it is, so it's always worth researching. Do you agree or disagree? I'm sure you yeah, agree. But, I surely but, agree that uh, this is something that should be treated with curiosity from the scientific community. Um, I'm very curious still, after all those years of investigating UFO cases, I've interviewed thousands of witnesses, of course. I've traveled thousands and thousands of miles to, to meet those people. and. Um, 
I'm impressed by m many of the stories, but I'm even more impressed when I can see hard evidence like uh, radar returns, good pictures, uh, tape recordings, indentations in, in the ground or something like that. So I think this is uh, a topic that uh, science have neglected for many years, which is very, very bad, of course. Uh, we use um, scientists here in Sweden uh, for help when we are trying to identify things. We have very good contact with the Swedish military and they help us with radar returns so we can uh, see what really was flying in the sky at that particular time of the day or night when, when this person saw something. And this has resulted in um, this huge archive. Uh, it's uh, 2.5 miles of shelves with uh, documents and uh, books and recordings, pictures, everything. Not only from Sweden, of course, but from all over the world, from the US, from Britain, from Europe, from Japan, from Russia. And our goal is to, uh, to build this archive to help researchers all around the world now and in the future to be a, a depository and help people. So we are scanning all the time. We are taking visitors who comes from all over the world to visit us. They are sitting there doing their research for days and maybe weeks. Uh, so now we are trying to find a bigger locality. I mean, we have, you know, 15 different localities on the same street today because we're expanding from locality to locality. But now we are trying to find just one big locality, large one really, to put everything into. Thank you. Um, OK, I just want to digress for just a moment uh, on another subject. Since you're from Sweden, there's something very interesting about that country that has, in modern times anyway, that I need to maybe get your take on. Um, I heard this one guy say that um, that uh, Sweden was kind of an oddball in regards to what was going on in the past few years with that illness that you shouldn't name on planet Earth <laughs> because uh, Sweden did uh, actually not really go along with the, what the rest of the world did. They actually uh, like didn't really lock down their country. They decided to let everybody get out and go around the world, uh, get, get out there and create herd immunity to try to get everybody um, uh, like infected with the disease so everybody would become immune with the disease. Uh, did that actually happen? Uh, and did, did it work out pretty well for you, the people of your country? Tell me, I'm kind of interested to know because you're from Sweden. I'm wondering yeah. how that worked out. Well, the thing about getting the herd immunity, that's not true. It was never, never uh, the goal here in Sweden. What we didn't do was to lock down the, the full society. We uh, uh, were very, very cautious. Uh, we tried to keep distance and um, we did everything else we could to avoid getting the disease. So we were never, never encouraged to, to try to, to get the disease. That, that's a misunderstanding. I can hear from time to time. Uh, as a journalist, I've written thousands of articles about the COVID-19. Uh, and um, I mean, we can see now that every country in the world uh, had the disease uh, spread just like Sweden in the end. Uh, we got it a little faster because we, we, we had a different approach, but uh, no country really, really, um, could could stop the COVID infection. Look at China now. Uh, thousands and thousands of Chinese die every week now, and uh, they they locked everything down. Of course, if you lock everything down all the time and never ever open again, you will stop it. But you must open sometime. And Sweden found out that it was impossible to lock a society down without getting a lot of other problems like uh, people were really, really hurting in many countries because they couldn't leave their house. Um, but this video you could, but you had to, to, to remain cautious. And that was the good approach, I think. It, I think we did the right thing there. Okay, 
Uh, just a little side issue there, but um, moving on. Uh, back to the UFO field. Um, regarding what UFOs are and what they aren't. Well, nobody knows what they are, hence the name UFO, unidentified flying object. Although I'm, Zachariah Sitchin once said uh, that, that you are, there's no such thing as a true UFO because the entity controlling the UFO can identify it. So therefore, in that sense, it's not unidentified, but that's not really the way people look at it. People look at it as the, from the outside observer who's uh, like just seeing something that they didn't expect to see up in the sky, or in some cases coming out of the water, the, uh, um, the submerged uh, UFOs. Um, so from a percentage standpoint, what are they? Well, those that think that they can identify them one individual in particular, George Kavaslis, uh, from, uh, <clears throat> from Australia. He uh, said many uh, years ago when I first started doing this show back in uh, 2013, I don't know if things have changed since then, but he said uh, at that time anyway, the majority of the UFOs had some connection to the military industrial complex. Uh, the late Stan Friedman wanted to disagree with that, saying, well, yeah, you are, there's a lot of UFOs that are connected to the government, but I never really thought that they were connected to the military because um, if they were uh, in the military, we would have used them in the wars, he asserted. Well, no. Stanton, I think, was failing to take into account the fact that all wars are banker wars. The uh, same banking interests control both sides of the wars, which means that... Um, they would, in the end, decide who gets to what, what technology each side gets to use, and if any uh, side of the war were to decide to get the upper hand by using UFO technology, the uh, wizards behind the curtain manipulating both sides of the wars would have uh, come out and said, "No, I'm sorry, you're not using uh, this technology. Now, with us pulling the strings in this war, you're not. You have to use only the technology we allow you." So, from that standpoint, I think Stan Friedman was mistaken saying uh, the, that we would have used in the wars, so I don't think that um, the UFOs have military connections. Well, um, okay, do you uh, think that there's truth to that, that the majority of UFOs have uh, some connection to the military industrial complex? And aside, and when you when talking a percentage factor, would you say a certain percentage are this, a certain percentage are that, a certain percentage of that, and yada, yada, yada? Could you maybe give your own percentage uh, numbers regarding how you would classify, categorize UFOs that you see out there? Yeah, first, I should say that I don't think any military in the world knows the answer of what UFOs are, and um, especially not the US, because they are now putting in so much money into this uh, new um, Aero office in, at the Pentagon, trying to find out uh, what their pilots are, are really encountering. They wouldn't do that if they were flying their own uh, contraptions around in the sky and scaring their own pilots. I think that would be very counterproductive. So, uh, and uh, Russia, of course, we have seen in Ukraine that they don't have any technology that impresses on us at all. Uh, so it's not from Russia. Uh, what's left is China, maybe. And if you read uh, the Identified Aerial Phenomena Task Force and the also all domain anomaly resolution office papers, you can see that they write that it could be from a foreign country, could be from Russia, could be from China, but it could also be something else. And when they say that, it's all blackened out. The next line is all blackened out. So we don't get to know what they really think it could be if it's not from any country on this earth. Um, it could, of course, be unusual natural phenomena, and it could, of course, be visitors from other dimensions, planets, or whatever you would, would prefer. Uh, I don't have the answer. I, I only know that real bona fide UFO observations are very, very scarce. We maybe get one maybe two in Sweden every year out of the more than 300 reports we are investigating. So very few are really you, you really unidentified flying objects. I mean, yeah, Jan Hynek, the astronomer, he said that the UFO must be 
unidentified also after a thorough investigation from a person that is skilled enough to do that investigation. After that, you can label it the UFO. So uh, it's very hard to, to get to label UFO, at least here in Sweden. You must be two observers uh, for us, for UFO Sweden, to, to uh, depict it as a UFO. So to me, it's a, it's a, it's a challenge. It's um, something I don't have the answer to. If I did have the answer, I wouldn't be into this anymore. Then I would be preaching. Uh, and I don't like preaching. <laughs> I am an investigator. I want to know. Uh, I don't want to believe. Yes, yeah, so we all want to know and we don't want to uh, believe, but um, as long as UFOs remain unidentified, we kind of have to uh, make a belief um, factor out of it. So, uh, I'm sorry, I just had someone walk into my house, a little bit of a distraction there, but I'll just try to try to ignore it. Um, and uh, well, um, so l let's talk about the um, history of um, UFO craft. Have they uh, changed over the course of time in regards to what their appearance is? Or would you say that... Um, the craft uh, that people saw back in antiquity and ancient times um, is generally the same as it is now, or has there been an evolution of sorts in regards to what the um, craft are and what they look like and what they appear to be, what people are seeing? Uh, there's that um, depiction of, um, I think it's Basel, Switzerland, of uh, a battle of uh, UFOs going on in the sky and... Um, there's some artwork from like the Middle Ages and the Renaissance showing um, one shows the UFO craft actually crashing down to earth, among other things. Um, do the craft over the course of time change the UFO craft people see? Are they generally, um, do they stay the same? Any uh, take on that? In many ways, they stay the same, like the flying shields you can See from the Roman times, I mean, 2000 years from now. And we're talking about flying shields and you can talk about flying saucers now, of course, they are exactly the same. But if you go back to, to modern times, like 1890, you had this Baltic wave of UFO sightings where people interpret what they saw as, as uh, spy balloons. And after that, 1896, 1897, you have the airship wave in the US, in the western and the middle of the US. People did see lights in the sky mostly, but they did interpret them as flying airships. Uh, not with, not machines really, but more like Zeppelins or things like that. And they, they also thought that they were built by some unknown inventor in the middle of Texas. That was what they were speculating about. Very few did think they were from another planet. And then in the early 1900s, you had those airships observed in, in England. In the 1930s, you had the ghost flyer over Scandinavia, where people saw things they thought were aircraft, and uh, but they only saw the lights from them. And then, of course, uh, in 1943, 1944, the Foo Fighters, were uh, mostly allied uh, crews flying over Germany and over the, the, the World War II theater in Europe, met those very strange things that followed their aircraft and sometimes they outflow them. In 1946, we had the ghost rockets in Sweden, those cigar shaped things that crashed into lakes and flew over us. And for, in 1947, we are in the flying saucer era. So there have been some sort of evolution, but maybe that comes to how we interpret what we are seeing. And maybe it's not the phenomenon, the phenomena that are evolving, but we are discussing it from our sociological point of view at that time we are living in. I heard you mention something interesting there. You actually said um, 
the year 1890 is like in modern times <laughs> um, why that date 1890 now that stands out to me um i seem to recall you and you mentioned some ufos may be made in texas well wasn't there um there was the uh, uh this pop famous ufo sighting in texas in aurora the, the aurora yes yeah. is that what, what um the one that you say is the start of in modern times uh, is that why you uh, pick that date or were there other things going on around that time besides that that how much I, I really picked 1890s as the Baltic uh, era when they started seeing those spy balloons. But 1896, 1897, there were loads of observations in the Middle West and the Western US. People were assembling on the roofs in cities like San Francisco, trying to spot these mysterious airships. And um, the crash in Aurora is still under debate. I mean, if it's true or not, I know quite a few friends in the US that are trying to find out if there is any tangible evidence that this crash really occurred or if it's just a tall tale in the newspaper. Because the 1800s newspapers in the US had loads of fake stories. There were so many fake stories, it's very hard to distinguish which one is real. They could put proper names of witnesses totally made up to make a good story in the newspaper. I mean, Chris Orbeck and Jacques Vallée with their work. I mean, Jacques Vallée with his, uh, of course, passport to Magonia. And uh, after that, uh, Chris Orbeck with the Wonders in the Sky and Return to Magonia, which he co-wrote with, with Vallée and Marty Schoeg, uh, shows us that the, the sky was filled with, with the same improbable and, and uh, strange things at that time. In the 1800s and 1700s as it is now. What is strange is that nobody, I mean, every one of us carries a cell phone with us and nobody takes a proper picture of a UFO. Uh, I get loads of pictures sent to me and to you for Sweden uh, every month. And no, not a single one of them is something that makes me tick. It's really just garbage, most of it. So, I'm back there again that the real UFO sightings are very, very, very scarce. And uh, to find the real ones in all this mess, that is what uh, keeps us awake at night and, and do the work. Well, you said that um, a lot of the ones you receive are garbage. Well, <clears throat> how, I mean, can you, how do you deduce that just by looking at the picture or the video that you receive? Don't you actually have to do a little research on the picture or the video to determine that it's garbage? To Sometimes it does take a minute. I mean, I just take a look at my sky map and I see they film Venus or Jupiter. It's very, very easy. Uh, and uh, even if it's not easily identifiable, it's only a speck of light in the sky. It doesn't give us any information it doesn't help us in any respect. Uh, aspects of light in the in the night sky could be so many things. Uh, and um, what I would love to see is a daylight picture of a strange craft. And uh, I'm still waiting for that here in Sweden. I mean, I'm still waiting for see a good picture in the world, really, uh, of a strange craft in daylight that has been properly investigated and uh, not been identified. Let's uh, try that again. In the event that um, because that happened, I hopefully I didn't lose the first half of the video. But if I did, then no, I don't think so. I saw that it was 30 minutes recorded in when I, I looked. All right. Well, hopefully I'll just have to combine them in that case. But if for whatever the reason it's not available, then I'll just make this an audio only. But um, hopefully that'll be the case. So. Uh, I, uh, what were you talking about? Something about yeah, about the, the film speech. clips we are getting from from people yes. who are only shooting specks of light in the night, and uh, I would love to see something more tangible. Uh, okay. Uh, well, at this point, since that happened, I think it may 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 it will make sense for me to uh, make this the point of the video where um, anybody wants to see the rest of this interview. Please subscribe to Patreon to be able to listen to the um, the rest of this um, 
I know everybody's strapped for uh, for money to stay an agent. It's hard to come by. I unfortunately had suck at least one person unsubscribe from my Patreon account because they said they couldn't afford to to pay for it and had to um, unsubscribe to be able to make ends meet. I don't blame them. It's kind of sad that I lost a subscriber for that reason, but um, I'm sure not. They're not the first. I'm not the first uh, radio host who's losing subscribers because people need to make ends meet but folks please consider uh subscribing to be able to listen to the rest of this interview and many others there's some valuable information on this show knowledge is uh and wisdom is power so um you never get enough of that with this show um i know some i know some people may be tempted to unsubscribe because it's harder for me to do as many shows nowadays as i did but still uh come on folks consider helping me out consider helping Klaus out and um I'm sure the rest of this interview will be some nice talking points that are worth listening to, so please consider subscribing. With that said, the rest of this interview is pay-per-view, and um, 